Good morning, everyone. Good morning to Jessica and Joshua. Uh, good morning to Year Four and Miss Brown. Miss Brown says we hope you're having a great day so far. Um, some Thomas says so do I. From Thomas, uh, it's wonderful to be back together. It's twenty past eleven on Tuesday, the 9th of February, two thousand and twenty-one, and we have flown back from Germany now, and we are back here firmly in Dorset, Dorset here in Dorchester. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that we've got a guest with us this morning. We've got Anne Brown. Good morning, Anne. Good morning. Anne is the learning manager at the Shire Hall Historic Courthouse Museum in Dorchester. How are you, Anne? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, we're good, thank you. Well, we're, we've been working up the mileage, uh, working our way to Berlin oh. this morning. I'll just change Done. my background because we, we're going to come away from Berlin and uh, head back to Dorchester because um, you're here to talk to us about something very special today. I am. I'm here to talk a little bit about Shire Hall Historic Courthouse Museum and one of the amazing stories that we've got there. So thank oh. you. I wonder if any of our children recognise this building because uh, it's it's in quite a prominent location. Yes, I wonder if anybody has ever walked past it or maybe driven past it when they're going up to the top of town or maybe even visited. I'm sure many of them have. I know our, us Which would be amazing. Definitely. Okay, so thank you ever so much for letting me join your assembly today. My name is Anne and I work at Shire Hall Historic Courthouse Museum in Dorchester, which is a bit of a mouthful. And you've seen a picture of it. And I'd be really interested to hear if anybody has visited us before. Unfortunately, because of the lockdown, we're closed at the moment. But some of you might have visited us last year when we had our spooky Halloween slime making, or maybe you did one of our trails and ended up in the cells or in the courtroom. We're a bit of an unusual museum because instead of having lots of objects or things like lots of museums have we're a bit different and I was wondering what your favorite museum is and I guess that some of you are going to type a message and tell me what your favorite museum is but whilst I'm waiting for that maybe I will have a little think and see if I can guess You've and got before we say that, we've got Mia and Arthur said that they oh. went around the museum on the Heritage Open Day a few years oh, ago. Oh, that's brilliant. That was a really, really, really busy day. So you must have come around <laughs> when there were lots and lots Thomas, of people. Thomas has also been to the museum. Brilliant. Well and, done, Thomas. Uh, Hoffman said, we came in during Open Dorchester in 2019. <laughs> we enjoyed it but we didn't like the cells. No, some people don't like the cells. I didn't like them at first, but because I have to spend quite a lot of time in there, I did get used to them eventually, but they are a little bit dark and damp and not very nice. But it does help us to think about all the people in the past who had to spend some time in those cells. Jessica oh, and Joshua like the Transport Museum in Glasgow and the Dinosaur Museum. Oh, that's a good selection. And uh, year four, like the Tank Museum and the Natural History Museum. Oh, brilliant. They were both on my list there. Yeah, the Tank Museum is really interesting, isn't it? I wonder if anybody can guess what do we see a lot of at the Tank Museum? <laughs> Dylan and <laughs> Selen have also been to the Shire Hall Historic Courthouse Museum. Oh, brilliant. That's a lot of you. I'm really mm. pleased about that. So you probably see saw me walking around with lots of keys in my pockets and dangling chains. Um, <laughs> and some of you have been to some fantastic museum. The Tank Museum is amazing because that tells us the story of, let's think, it tells us the story of tanks. And not only that, but it also tells the story of some of the people in the past who who drove the tanks, who used them. And I wonder... And I expect that probably a lot of you have also been to the Dorset Museum and probably went there when Dippy the Dinosaur was on his tour. 
And if you look at the front of our building there, sometimes when we're having our morning tea and biscuits, we think, would we be able to fit Dippy into our building? Because he was absolutely enormous. And we kind of decide that if we were to bend his neck and his tail a little bit, then we might be able to squeeze him through one of those doors there. Um, but he looked absolutely fantastic in the Dorset Museum in that big room that they've got there. Um, some of the other museums, somebody mentioned was the Natural History Museum. That's another fantastic one where you can see lots and lots of fossils and dinosaurs and things which tell us about the history of the Earth. And I don't know if anybody's been to the Science Museum Oh, you like uh, ter- like the tank museum? That's fantastic. The science museum is amazing because it's got things like space and rockets and steam engines and all sorts of things which tell us about sciencey things about the history of science. And my favourite bit is is the bit about the history of medicine and how people through the ages have tried to help people to to make them better if they're ill. Um. Lots and lots of fantastic museums. There's museums where you can find out about the history of aeroplanes or costumes or places, all sorts of different ones. And I can see some fantastic ones coming up here. You too, so they're looking forward to the opening of Dorset County Museum. Yes, that's going to be happening. Hopefully when museums open up, then they'll be able to open up at the same time. Brilliant. So some great museums coming through here. And I'm really glad that you all enjoy going to them. My favourite museum is the British Museum. And that's another one that's in London because I like really old things, really ancient things. And one of my favourite parts of that museum is the bit which has the ancient Egyptian mummies with their pots and their paintings and their jewellery and their treasures. And we don't have anything like that at Shire Hall, but instead we have something else which I like just as much as those objects or things. And the thing that we have lots and lots of are stories, the stories of people who found themselves at Shire Hall a long time ago. Now, I love stories I love reading them, I love listening to them, and I love telling them as well. So today I'm going to tell you one of my favourite stories from Shire Hall. Now, it's important to remember that this isn't a story that I or someone else has made up. This is a real story about real life and real people that happened a long time ago. And I like it because even though it happened nearly 190 years ago, which is a long, long time ago, I think there's some very important things that we can learn from it today. So we're going to go back in time. It's a little bit like being in a time machine or being Doctor Who. We're going to go back to the 1830s, just before a very famous queen was in charge of this country. And I wonder, does anybody know what that queen's name was? And I won't tell you. I'll wait a few minutes to see if anybody knows the answer to that question. At the time, In the 1830s, Shire Hall was a really important place. It was called the Crown Court of Dorset, which is a very, very grand title. It was the place where people who had broken the law or committed or done a crime, um, a crime like stealing something or damaging things or even hurting other people, they were sent to Shire Hall to the courtroom to stand in front of a judge. Now, I've got a picture of the courtroom up and hope you can all see it. And if you look right at the back of the picture, you can see two very bright windows. And in between those windows you can see a shiny lion and unicorn and underneath that is a great big chair and on that chair that's where the judge the judge sat in the courtroom and i've actually got a photo of one of our teachers here 
um, <laughs> taking up that role when we went to visit because <laughs> our staff actually visited the courtroom. There's a picture here of all the staff in the courtroom look. And, oh, that's amazing. Uh, Mr. McBean <laughs> as the judge look. So this is where the judge would be, and this is a sort of, I'm not sure he's quite wearing the clothes in the right way, Anne, but... No, I think he might have them back to front there a little, but <laughs> never mind. He, he was very good at taking up the role. Oh, good. <laughs> Did he make sure that everybody was nice and quiet in the court? <laughs> we have a few guesses on the Queen. Harry says Queen Victoria. Someone else says Queen Victoria. Someone says King George. Uh, Ooh, Katie and some... says Queen Victoria. Um, who's the Queen? Was it Queen Victoria? Says Lana. Um, um, lots of people. Amazing. Excellent. Those are some really good answers there. And if you said Queen Victoria, Queen Victoria, you are absolutely right. So well done. She was a really famous queen and she was the one who was on the throne when the story I'm going to tell you um, was, was taking place. So in this courtroom, underneath the lion and the unicorn where the judge sat right at the back in his big chair, uh, he, like you saw your teacher, he wore a great big red robe and a kind of curly wig on his head. And that was to show people in the court and people outside how really important he was. So the judge was in charge of the courtroom, a little bit like your teachers are in charge of your classroom. So he would make sure that everyone did the work that they were supposed to, everyone listened to each other, that they were kind to each other most of the time and that everyone followed the rules because there were a lot of rules in that courtroom. One of his most important jobs was to make sure that the person who had done a crime or broken the law and was standing in the box that you can see right in the middle of the courtroom in front of the judge, he, the judge had to make sure that that person was treated fairly. So the person who was said to have committed the crime or broken the law was allowed to tell people in the court what had happened and whether they were guilty, whether they'd done the crime or not guilty, whether they hadn't done it. Other people that we call witnesses stood in one of the other boxes that you can see in the corner of the courtroom there and they told stories of what they said had happened and sometimes all the stories were the same but most of the time all the stories were a little bit different and listening to those stories were 12 really important people and they were sat in the little wooden box just in front of the judge to his left and they were called a jury so it was their job to listen really carefully to everyone, including the judge, and decide whether the person was guilty, whether they'd done the crime or not guilty, whether they'd not done it. The judge would then have to decide what pun the punishment would be if they were guilty or if they were not guilty, he'd let them go home. Now, remember I said it was a judge's job to make sure everyone is treated fairly. In the past, in the 1800s, sometimes this didn't always happen. Like in the story I'm going to tell you now. So our story starts in the 1830s, nearly 190 years ago, in a little village quite near Dol Dorchester called Tolpuddle. And I expect some of you might have been to Tolpuddle. It's a very nice little village with um, lots of lovely houses with thatched roofs and fields and farms around it. In the 1830s, like almost all the villages in Dorset at that time, most people who lived there were for farmers and for people who owned farmland. And these people were called, now this is a bit of a mouthful, so I'm going to have to be careful I say it properly. They were called 
agricultural laborers, which means it was their job to look after farm animals like cows and sheep and sheep and pigs and to work in the fields plowing the soil and growing and harvesting crops like wheat and grains and vegetables. Most of these people were very very poor and they were really hard outside in all weathers throughout the year even on Christmas day but weren't paid very much money to do so. Now you can see in this picture this is a drawing of agriculture cultural labourers, these people from that time in the 1830s. And this is a picture that we've got in our museum. And um, the Tolpuddle men and their families would have looked like this. And you can see in the picture, have a look at what they're wearing and what it tells you about these people. Because they are wearing clothes um, which were typical for that time. It's the sort of clothes that ordinary people wore. But I want you to have a look to see if you can tell me um, some of the men are wearing something on top of their clothes. And I wonder if you can spot that for me and maybe have a think about why they might be wearing those. So whilst you're thinking about that, we can have a look on this picture. We can tell that these um, these people worked on the land, worked for farms, because in the background, I don't know if you can see a horse. And before tractors and combine harvesters were invented, then horses were used to help the agricultural labourers do all the work on the farm, like ploughing and harvesting and those really important jobs. The man who's kind of almost in the middle is carrying a great big, it's like a fork, and that was used for um, turning over and bringing in the grains and the crops. So that tells us a little bit about what the, the people were doing right in the background. And it might not be terribly clear. There is a house and that house has got thatch or straw on the roof. But sometimes there were holes in that roof that let in the rain. And sometimes the doors and the windows didn't fit properly. So that let in the wind and the cold as well. And there were no carpets or wooden floors in the house. It was just the bare earth because these were very poor people who, who virtually had nothing apart from a few belongings and the clothes that they wore. Alfie says you can see that they're wearing a hat. Ah, yes, they're all wearing hats because in the 1830s, everybody wore a hat. Now, if you were working in the fields in the summer or the winter, it was a really good idea to wear a hat because if you were in the sun, it stopped your head from burning. And in the winter, it would keep your ears warm because it'd be really cold if you were outside on a, on a day like today. So a hat is a really, really good answer. If we have a look at what some of the men are wearing, the man who's got the big um, fork in his hand and the pot, he's wearing something over his clothes. And the man at his side also has, has the same sort of clothes on. And I don't know if anybody knows what this call is called. It's called a smock. And a smock is a, it's a little bit like an apron or an overall that you put on when you're cooking or doing art. And it's to protect your clothes because these people were so poor that they only had one set of clothes. We're very lucky today. We've got lots of clothes and they go in the washing machine and we wash and dry them. And we've got other clothes to wear while that's happening. These people would only have had the set of clothes that they work in and maybe they would have had a set of really a slightly better clothes which they would wear to go to church on a Sunday. So it's really important when they were doing all their hard work in the fields and looking after the animals that they protected the only clothes that they had. So they would wear a smock, a little bit like an apron. Now, I can see in this picture, one of the children is also wearing a smock like the men. I wonder if anybody knows what 
that means? What does that tell us about that boy? Um, I will wait a few seconds to see if anybody can answer that question. Some of the other children and the men and women in the picture are just wearing their ordinary clothes. So we kind of know that they're probably not going to go out into the fields to work on the day that this picture was was drawn. But what about that boy? I wonder if anybody has got an answer. So if the men wear smocks because they go out into the fields to do dusty, dirty work, and they wear the smocks because it protects their clothes, why would there be a boy wearing a smock as well? What does that tell us about what he was doing? So year, th year three, say, because he was doing the same job? Absolutely fantastic. Spot on. He was doing the same job, even though he's probably only about seven or eight years of old he was expected to go out into the fields just like the men and do jobs to earn money to help their family rather than go to school like we do today so children and children just like you would have, have gone out and worked in the fields as well um but you wouldn't have he was farming exactly that's a really good answer so he was helping with the farming work. So his job would be to do things like scare birds so that the birds wouldn't eat the crops or pick up stones in the field and move them to one side so that when they were plowing and when the, the plants were growing, the stones wouldn't stop them. So spot on, brilliant answer. So even if you were a child, you were expected to go out into the fields and work as well. Could I have the next picture, please? Amazing. Here we have someone very important in our story. So in Tolpuddle, most people worked for this man. He was called Squire Frampton. He was very rich and very powerful. He knew lots of really, really important people. And he owned the farms and the land all around the village. So everybody who worked on the farms worked for him. This is um, a new picture, which is like one that was painted of him in the 1830s. Now, at that time, Squire Fram Frampton had a problem. The price of his crops, the wheat and the vegetables and the meat from the animal that was grown and produced on his land was going down. This meant that what he sold made him less money and he was not very happy about not having as much money for his crops as he used to. So instead of just accepting that, that he wasn't making as much money as he used to because the prices had changed, he decided that the way to solve that would be to pay the people who worked for him less money. Hmm. He didn't just do this once. He did this four times. So the people who were working on the farms were earn, doing the same work, exactly the same, but they were earning less and less money. So everybody was still working really hard as much as they'd always done, but they were paid so little money for their work that some families couldn't afford to buy food or look after their families properly. And people just didn't know what they could do. Life was really hard for those people in Tolpuddle. So a group of men in the village of Tolpuddle decided it was time they tried to do something. Maybe they could talk to F Squire Frampton and ask him if he wouldn't mind paying them what they used to be paid, paying them the same amount of money so that they could live on that like other farm workers in, Dors in Dorset had. What they wanted to do was not only try to make things better for themselves 
and their own families, but also make things better for everyone else who was struggling in the village of Tolpuddle and in other places as well. Could I have the next slide, please? So, the leader of the group was a man called George Loveless. We don't have any photographs of George or any of the other men from Tolpuddle because cameras weren't invented in the 1830s. And because they were only poor people, they would never have their um, face painted or they'd, ne they'd never be a, a painting of them because they just couldn't have afforded that. This, this, these pictures that you see here and the one of Squire Frampton that we've just seen was made very recently, a couple of years ago, by an amazing artist called Jason Wilshire Mills. And Jason loves the story of the Tollpuddle Martyrs. It's one he learnt about when he was a little child. And he has made these pictures of the men using his imagination and an iPad. So this is his fantastic digital art. And he's put all sorts of details and smaller pictures into the bigger pictures, which tell you a little bit about the stories of these men um, and their life in Tolpuddle. So if you look very carefully, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see, but if you look really carefully, I wonder if you can see some butterflies and some bees and some ladybirds um, and some moths and all sorts of different insects that you see um, in Dorset. And you might also see some trees and leaves and things like that. Um, if you can see some of those things in the picture, I wonder if you could let me know what you've spotted, because sometimes, even though I've looked at these pictures a lot, sometimes I see things which I've never seen before. And it's always exciting to find something new. And Jason came to work with us when he came to Dorchester. He, oh, yes. He was one of the schools that he worked with. I think um, children that are currently in year four worked with him when they were in oh. year three. So oh, some, that's amazing. Some, yeah. of the children, some of the children watching might remember working with Jason. He's such an, a, a fantastic artist and he's doing some work at the moment, which when Shire Hall opens again, hopefully for the summer, um, is going to be displayed there. And, and some of it is is what we call augmented reality so there's all sorts of moving images and things as well so we're really looking forward to seeing Jason again. Excellent so this is some of his his amazing work which we had on display at Shire Hall and it will be going up again so when it goes up I'll, I'll let you know. So George Loveless was was kind of the leader of the group of people who wanted to see if they could ask Squire Frampton if he could pay them more money and maybe if he could help them make things better. And next to him is James Loveless, and he was George Loveless's brother. And both George and James were married and they had children and they, they all lived in the village. And if you look at the picture of James, you can see I think his jacket is made up of tiny pictures of, of leaves. So, um, again, Jason in both those pictures has, has brought out all those beautiful things. Oh, you can see all oh, butterflies and birds and leaves. Amazing. Can I have the next slide, please? Brilliant. So the next slide is of two more men who joined together with George and James Loveless. And we've got Thomas Stanfield, who was the oldest man in the group. He was 44 years old and he had five children. And one of those children was John Stanfield, who's by his side. And I particularly like the two pictures of the Stanfields because you can really clearly see the leaves in Thomas's picture and those beautiful butterflies who were resting on John Stanfield's jacket. And in the background, you can see all sorts of different pictures which um, tell us a little bit more about Tollpuddle and about the story of the men. So can we have the next slide as well, please?
So there were six men all together from Tolpuddle who wanted to join together to see if they could talk to Squire Frampton to see if they could do anything to make things better for themselves. And apart from the Lovelaces and the Stanfields, we also had James Brine. He was the youngest man in the group. He was only about 20 years old. And James Hammett. James was a bit different from the other five men. He didn't go to the same church that they did. And all the others had known each other for a very long time since they were growing up in the village. But James um, didn't know them quite, quite so well. Could I have the next slide? Thank you. OK, so this group of six men got together and with a few others, they met under the big sycamore tree in the village of Tolpuddle. Now, that tree is still there by the green today. And this is a picture that um, Jason made of the tree. And it's really nice that in his picture he's put the roots because that shows us how old and how um, important this tree was. So the six men and some others from the village met under the big sycamore tree and they they called their group, they called it a friendly society, which just means that it was a group of people who were trying to do good things. And what they also did, they swore an oath to work together to make things better for everyone. Now, an oath is a little bit like a promise to do something. So if you are in rainbows or brownies or beavers or cubs, you make a special promise um, when you join your pack to do your best and to be kind and to be helpful. And the six men from Tolpuddle, their oath was a little bit like that. It was about being good to each other and helping, helping people. Squire Frampton was not very happy at all to find out that the men had joined together to ask for, for more pay um, and to ask for things to be better, because this would mean that he would not make as much money as he wanted. So he decided that something had to be done about this. So working with some very important people in the government, like the Home Secretary, who is almost as important as the Prime Minister, he had the six men arrested in Tolpuddle in February 1834. So just as they were getting up at dawn, just as the light was, was coming through, the constable of the village arrested them at their houses and made them walk all the 16 kilometres to the prison in Dorchester. Now, I know you're doing a fitness challenge in February. Um, so the 16 kilometre walk from Tolpuddle to Dorchester would be an amazing part of a challenge. So the men were arrested. <coughs> it wasn't a crime to join together in a group like the six men had, but it was a crime to swear an oath. So in March 1834, the six men stood in the courtroom at Shire Hall, the courtroom that we've just seen in that picture, in front of the judge and told the court why what they were doing wasn't wrong. They were just trying to look after their families and other working people's families too, to make sure that they were paid fairly for their work and that they could look after their families. Could I have the next slide, please? So this is the Tolpuddle cell in Shire Hall. So those of you who have visited on Heritage Open Day and other times will probably have gone down into there. And you'll know that usually it's a little bit darker than this. We had to put special lights in it to make sure that when we took a photograph, we could actually see what was there because it's so far under the earth that it's all dark and it's all damp. And those six men from Tolpuddle had to stay in that little tiny room for three days and three nights at Shire Hall. And 
the room that you can see, it's exactly the same as it was when they stayed there in 1834. Nothing has changed at all. It was a really uncomfortable room. It was even colder and even damper and smellier than it is today. They were given some green wood to burn on the fireplace that you can see right in the corner at the bottom. But green wood doesn't give off much heat when you set fire to it. And it filled the room with smoke. So it made them cough and choke. So it was a really horrible experience for them. Could I have the next picture, please? So we're back in the courtroom now with the lion and the unicorn and the great big windows. Remember, I said it was a judge's job to make sure everyone in that courtroom is treated fairly, that everyone is listened to. Well, there was a bit of a problem with the, the trial of the Tollpuddle Men because the judge was a friend of Squire Frampton. Do you think that would mean he would treat the men fairly? I wonder, have a think about that. So if he already knows the Squire Frampton, the person who wants the men from Tolpuddle to be punished for joining together in a group, do you think he's going to treat them fairly? Mm, I wonder if we'll get some answers coming through. Anybody think he was treated fairly, he would treat them fairly or unfairly? Whilst you're having a think about that, we will have a think about what the judge would do next. So he had to listen to everything that was said in the courtroom. The jury, the people who listen to all the stories and decide whether Ah, <laughs> quite a clear answer from Rosa there. Yes, yeah, I like the use of capitals there. That's a definite no, no. Lana, Lana doesn't think it would be fair. No. The year four think they that they would be treated unfairly. Unfairly, I think we're getting oh yeah. not oh three, capital not letters. Fairly. Sorry, the Wilson family say not fairly. Yeah. And, uh, and year three say <gasps> unfairly. I think there's a very strong pattern emerging here. So Another you clear, will... no, no. <laughs> so if you said no, you are absolutely right because um, he wouldn't want to treat them fairly because he already knew Squire Frampton and he knew the re result that. Squire Frampton wanted to happen in this courtroom. So to make that happen, the judge didn't behave very fairly at all. He very carefully told the jury, remember those are, pe are the people who listen to the story and decide whether um, the men were guilty, whether they'd done it or not guilty, not done it. The judge very carefully told the jury that he couldn't tell them what to do, but if they didn't decide that the six men had broken the law and were guilty, then the jury were going to be in big trouble. And that is big in capital letters. So if that jury didn't find the men guilty, they were going to be in so much trouble. And that trouble was really serious. It would mean that they lost their jobs, they would lose their businesses, their houses, maybe some of their money. It would have been really, really serious for them. So guess what? Who can tell me, do you think the jury decided that the six Tolpuddle men were guilty or not guilty? So do you think after the judge told them that they were going to be in really big trouble if they didn't find them guilty, do you think that jury found them guilty or not guilty? Well, we have those answers come in. Lama thinks he was acting to protect his protect friends. 
Yeah, that's a great answer. Yeah, that's exactly what he was doing. Oh, we've had a few more. Oh, yeah. Guilty, says Lana. Guilty. There would have been a lot of shouting in the courtroom as well. It wasn't a quiet place like it is today. Everybody was have been very noisy and they'd be trying to tell their stories and their point of view. Rosa says guilty. Mm -hmm. uh, year three say guilty. Yeah. I think we are unanimous here. Yeah, we've got lots of guilties. And guess what? The jury found the six men guilty. They said they had broken the law. Now, the judge then told the men what their punishment would be for breaking the law, for swearing that oath, which was illegal. You weren't supposed to do that. Um, and the judge said that their punishment was to be transported or sent to Australia for seven years. Now, if you told me that you were going to send me to Australia for seven years, I probably, if I could take my family with me, I probably wouldn't be too unhappy because I've seen photos and films of Australia. I know that the weather is really warm and nice and much nicer than it is today and that there's lovely beaches and there's cities and towns and they've got cinemas and shops and lots of things happening and there's loads of things to do and everything I need. I'm not too keen on insects, so I might be a little bit worried about that, but I do love koala bears, so I'd be really happy to go and see them. So Australia to me seems like quite a nice place, but in 1834 it was a terrible place to get to and a terrible place to live. So that picture of the ship that we've just seen, I wonder if we could just go back and have a look at that. This is the ship that the prisoners were sent to Australia on. So 1834, no aeroplanes. And even with an aeroplane, it's a really long journey to Australia. I wonder if anybody um, in Prince of Wales has been to Australia because it takes ever such a long time. But in a ship just like that, it would take at least three months to get to Australia. So it was dangerous. It was uncomfortable. The prisoners were locked up in little cages on the ship or else they had to do some of the really hard work, like looking after the sails and the wood. So three months of danger and discomfort um, until they arrived in Australia. If I could have the picture of Australia, please. And this is another of Jason's pictures. When the prisoners got to Australia, they were treated very badly, often working unpaid like slaves for other people. There wasn't much food and water. There were no really nice buildings or towns and cities like there are today. Yeah. Um, the, if you were ill, there was no medicines. There was a kind of hospital, but it couldn't treat most of the people who were ill. And often some of the people who were there weren't very nice to each other. It was also incredibly hot and the sun burnt you. So if you came from Dorset, where it gets quite sun sunny in the summer, but not half as hot as Australia, it would have been really difficult to adjust to what it was like over there. There were also plenty of spiders and snakes and animals that were quite happy to bite, sting and poison you. Insects and animals that the men had never seen in Dorset. So remember those lovely butterflies and bees that we saw on Jason's pictures? The bees in Australia are nothing like the bees we've got over here. And there's one type of bee, which is bright green. So imagine if you've never heard of that, a bright green bee might be a little bit scary. And they were also much bigger than our bees as well. Despite all the hardship and suffering the men experienced, they carried on looking after each other and carried on looking after some of the other people who were living in the same places in Australia. 
Thomas Stanfield, the oldest man in the group, was very badly treated. And despite being ill a lot of the time, he was expected to look after thousands of sheep in the middle of nowhere on his own and had to sleep in a wooden hut with no roof. As a result of this, he became very ill. His son, John, worked for a much better man and he let him walk hours and hours to go and see his father on his day off to visit him and help him. And some of the other people gave him food and things that um, he would need for his father to be more comfortable. So you might think that was the end of the story, but it's not. Many people over here in this country heard about the trial and were angry at the way Squire Frampton, the judge and their friends had treated the six men. After all, they were only trying to look out for people. So people got together to make petitions, long lists of names saying that they didn't agree with how the men had been treated. And huge groups of people went on walks and protests they wanted the government to pardon or let the men off so that they could come back to Dorset. Could I have the next slide, please? Brilliant. Eventually, this worked. And after four years, in 1838, all the men returned as free men. So they could go back to their lives. They didn't have to go to prison or anything like that. These are drawings of them that were made when they were back in England. They were famous because of what happened to them, which is why they had their drawings taken. Squire Frampton and all his friends wouldn't let any of the men work in Dorset again. So they moved to Essex, which is near London. And eventually everyone except James Hammett moved to live in Canada. James returned to live in Dorchester. Because lots of people were so angry about what had happened to the six men and so impressed with what the, they had done to help other people, more and more friendly societies, groups of people working together were made. There were so many people that F Squire Frampton, people like him, couldn't do anything about it. They couldn't send thousands of people to court in Australia again. So these groups worked hard to carry on the work of the six men, the toll puddle martyrs, making sure people were paid enough money to live for their work and were looked after and making sure that people looked after each other as well. People were very impressed with what the six men had done. They called them the Tolpuddle Martyrs because a martyr is someone who gets punished or who has a really hard time for standing up for what they believe in or for helping people in diff difficult circumstances when um, other people are against them. So even though they had a terrible time, their actions helped lots of other people, both in the past, then and now. So what I think is most important about the story of the six men is that they showed us that if we work together, we can make a difference or make things better, not just for ourselves and our families, but for other people as well. And I know that at Prince of Wales, you are all amazing at working together in your school, the children, the staff and the families and everybody who supports them. You do lots of things that make a real difference to everyone, like your green environmental and recycling work and your work supporting people in your community and how you treat people fairly and kindly in school as well. I know things are very hard at the moment with the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdown, but we can still carry on working together, thinking about other people and finding opportunities to make a difference, even if it's remotely like we're doing today. We remember people like the Tolpuddle Martyrs because history is an amazing way of learning. And it's not just about finding out what life or things were like in the past. It's about thinking what the past can teach us for today and what we can do now and in the future to make a difference. So be like my superheroes, the Tolpuddle Martyrs. Carry on working together to make things better for everyone and 
don't forget to tell me about it. I'd love to hear and I'd love to help if I can as well. So hopefully when Shire Hall Historic Courthouse Museum opens again, you'll come along and see me and discover, discover some of more of our people's stories from the past that we tell in our museum. And I'll really look forward to seeing you then. Thank you ever so much for letting me share the Toll Puddle Martyr's story with you today and enjoy the rest of your day. And if anybody's got any questions that they think of now or later, I'm very happy to be contacted or um, to answer those questions. And thank you so very much for your input this morning and for sharing the story of the Toll Puddle Martyrs with us. It's been absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined in from home and uh, contributed to today's assembly. Um, we're gonna finish with a song from year two. Um, and we will see you back live at four o'clock. And thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you.